Popcorn Ready podcast, and I love what you, I love what you guys do. Um, I'm, 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 I've been trying to get Tara on the show too, so hopefully uh, he agrees to come on soon. But uh, first of all, um, before we get started with your career and your journey, um, how are you and your family doing during the tough situation? Uh, well, I'm good. I'm good. Like I said, family is healthy. Um, you know, I, I told my mom when this whole thing happened at the very beginning, for all those times I was on punishment and I was grounded. Well, now she's grounded and she can't go outside. So <laughs> I kind of returned the favor because, you know, for about three, she lives in South Carolina for, for about three, four months there, you know, that, that you didn't want the elderly people to even be near you know, anyone with the virus. So I put her on punishment and like, just stay home. You know, you're allowed to go to the grocery store, uh, you know, get the necessities. But besides that, try to stay home and stay out of a, stay out of harm's way. But um, everybody's good. Everybody's good trying to stay positive and, and work through it. And, uh, you know, I disagree with a lot of people saying 2020 is the worst year ever. I'm like, it's, it's just an obstacle. You know, we'll be okay. You just keep fighting, wake up and, you know, live the life. Oh, by the way, uh, before we go any further, uh, Taiko Spikes and uh, Reyes said hi. Yeah, yeah. Tell them I said what up. Takeo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, guys, what's up, fellas? <laughs> yeah, I've been in contact with them. They've been seeing my stuff, and they said, uh, they said I'm, he, they're impressed with myself. So I said, that's, that's an honor, too, from them. So coming from them. Um, but my first question to you is, uh, when did you get interested in playing football, and um, who was your biggest influencer in that? Oh, man. I was um... – I was a football junkie. Uh, when I was five, six, seven years old, I was the kid that stayed out, you know, when it was dark out and I was just out there throwing the ball to myself and, and tackling myself, and, you know, having five Super Bowl games in a row of just out there just loving the game of football. And that love just kind of never left, you know, went from there, from doing that, because I didn't, I didn't grow up around a lot of kids. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, like, pretty much it was just me and my, my brother and my three sisters at the time. But they weren't going to play with me. My sisters weren't playing football. My brother didn't like football. So I was just out there playing ball by myself in the backyard. Hmm. And um, then when I finally got to, you know, I think nine, ten-ish, when I played my first season of a, what we call peewee football or midget football right. um, back in the day, um, and I guess we can't say midget football is not politically correct anymore, but it's peewee football. <laughs> yeah. And you know, so that's when I started being around like the other kids and playing it. And I, I just absolutely loved everything, you know, that the sport was, was giving me. And as, as far as not just, you know, fun scoring touchdowns, but it's just the, the character building, the integrity building, the work ethic, um, you know, accountability, problem solving, you know, all those things were very important to me as you know, looking back as a kid and kind of and kind of groomed me. And, um, you know, from there I started just why I, I was a, a crazy watcher of football. Like I would literally sit there all Sunday. This is like back in the day when there were two games on, you know, had, uh, you know, let's say NBC had the one o'clock game. So I'm yeah. from Cleveland, Ohio originally. Oh. So I had the one o'clock game, the four, then it had the four. Uh, to seven, but there were no Sunday night games. So I just, you know, sat there like one to seven and I used to take notes. You know, I took notes the whole, every single you know, Sunday, sat there writing stats down. Uh, I remember, like I said, Steelers were my team at the time. So like uh, Mark Malone would be uh, 16 for 26 throwing for 270 yards. Like I had every single, I had every single stat down. And um, like I said, I just, I just loved it. I loved everything about it. And the players at the time, I didn't love any player. I didn't have a favorite player in football. My favorite athlete growing up was Michael Jordan basketball. I don't know how that intertwined, but it did. And, but I just like, I love watching the Steelers and I loved, you know, the Jordan as a, as a single player uh, growing up. So um, I obviously, uh, you, you, you do a podcast with T.O., but uh, when was it? obviously I, I guess he was in the same uh, same uh, league. he was still playing when you were playing um, yeah but, yeah so is that when when did you first start start in connecting with him and um, did he help you along the way throughout your career <laughs> no he didn't help me because we didn't play with each other right. um, at the time I was with the Minnesota Vikings and uh, you know. Chris Carter was the Wiley vet for us. Oh, wow. Uh, then my second year, Randy Moss came. Oh, um, so, you know, we had Moss, Carter. We had a guy by the name of Jake Reed, who wow. 
who's in today's game would be a, a five-time Pro Bowler, um, and then myself. And in uh, 1998, we go out and, you know, we set every offensive record known to man. And as the offense, we were considered the best offense ever in NFL history. Hmm. And then, of course, you had in San Francisco, you had Jerry, JJ, which was his number, the, the first round pick. And then, like, T.O. kept getting better and better and better. So now that big three became like, okay, who has the better receiving core, the Vikings or the 49ers? Hmm. So I didn't know him at the time, but of course watching and, you know, just knowing who, you know, who each other were and he'll probably say, I didn't even know who he was, but <laughs> he knows. Cause I would, cause that, that one year I went 80 on him. So he knows <laughs> <laughs> um, when they came to the dome, but no. So we, uh, I think the first time we, saw each other off the football field was at the airport randomly you know we're going just crossing paths like where are you going where are you going what's up what's up you know type of deal talk for a little bit and um I remember I was doing um celebrity basketball weekends in like uh Oklahoma City from um my old university Langston University LU shout out yeah. and I was like come down to the uh you know for the celebrity weekend basketball you know a comedy show party hangout type of deal and so he came and like I said, we were just kind of always, we always liked doing the same type of stuff. And then when he retired in what, 08, 09, 10, something like that, you know, he came, he moved to LA. And so now we've both been in LA and like I said, we're pretty, we're pretty close friends over this last two years, of course, um, he gives each other or us, you know, we look at the, our past with different perspectives, um, you know, cause again, my motivation uh of, of having a career that was it <laughs> you know the the the, the hall of fame career and 150 touchdowns and you know get your name by having a personality through football that was the dream of mine um so like i said i, I see him in that light but at the same time we're we're you know, older we're matured we look back on our careers and like I said, it's, uh, it's appreciative of what he brought to the game, even though some people don't look at it like that. Right. But as, as you know, 2020, they're doing all the stuff he was doing in 2000 and <laughs> was getting ridiculed for. And again, I just remember when I was in college, I, uh, I think I took my helmet off once in college and got a 15 yard penalty. And I just, I just don't, I didn't understand it. You know, I'm like, that's nothing. We can't take our helmets off, you know, but all this stuff now, of course, has come full circle and it's part of the game. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad it is. Yeah. So um, before we get to your NFL career, I just want to, this is a two part question. Um, what made mm -hmm. you led to choose Langston University and um, take me back to your draft process too. And uh, what was that like getting the call from the Vikings? Oh man. So Langston, I chose Langston cause I, I didn't have anywhere else to go. Um, I was a late bloomer physically. I didn't know. <laughs> kids were out there running four three and four four i was a four eight forty guy coming out of high school right. uh, defensive back and quarterback and um I, I just i didn't have a lot of options and i said i went to the camp went to ohio state went to tennessee went to colorado and that summer i remember i bused to all of those different camps from cleveland so i mean i think the tennessee bus ride was like 24 hours or something crazy the colorado bus ride was 24 hours hmm. tennessee was like 18 but I just wanted to see, you know, comp the, the nationwide competition. Back then, we didn't have the rivals and the Nike or you could go see the top high school kids. So I just was trying to find competition and, and sharpen my tool. And uh, I was maybe, maybe 6'1", 158 pounds as a senior in high school playing quarterback. And again, I didn't have the, the prototype body nor the division one level body at that time. So I wound up going to a Mercyhurst College actually as a freshman, was there for one semester, and then I transferred to Langston. And when I got there, I was just like, you know what? I, there's only two NFL quarterbacks who are African-American at the time. That was uh, Randall Cunningham and Warren Moon. Yeah. Um, I think Doug Williams had just got done in Tampa. And then I was just like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have a good shot. So let me switch my position to receiver. Hmm. And uh, I switched to receiver. And I was just like, I have to make it from here. You know, it's like, I can't go switch back and I can't now go to DB. Like I could have played DB, don't get it twisted. Like, but <laughs> I was like, I can't keep changing position. So I just honed in on my skill um, at Langston and said, start doing 
uh, everything I could get my hands on because I didn't, we didn't really, I had a wide receivers coach my senior year, Ron Ingram, but prior to that, I didn't even have a wide receivers coach at Langston. Hmm. So I'm sitting there just watching games on Sunday. Um, so back in the day, how they would they show a game on a Fox or whatever, and the outside receivers, you really didn't show on the TV screen. So when the ball is snapped and as the, the camera pans out, you would catch glimpses of the outside receiver. Hmm. And that's all the film I would go off of. You know what I'm saying? Like I wouldn't see the release, but then I would see like Michael Urban four right. yards down the field, make his break at 10, wow. or Chris Hard doing the same thing on the other side, hmm. you know, in certain games. But that's all the film I could study. I didn't have anything to study. So just like I record that and go back and watch little things like that, little, you know, uh, techniques and stuff and try to pick that up. And that was pretty much that, uh, that Langston process of learning football, which is this whole nother side of becoming a better athlete. Becoming a better athlete was like, you know, didn't go home in the summers. I stayed at Langston, worked out, was doing the six to eight hours a day working out, you know, wake up at, you know, 530, work out six to eight go home, you know, go to uh, summer school, take a nap, get back up, work out again, go eat dinner, get back up, work out again, and then get a workout in later that night sometime. So that was the process for about three and a half to four years. And, you know, then when I finally got to uh, the league, I was, uh, I was considered a speedster for the first time in my life. And I remember I was like, I never heard that tag to my name. You know, even though I was getting faster in college, I wasn't there yet. Um, and I ended up running a, a four three, a, a low four three four three eight four three nine coming out, hmm. and I was considered a big body speedster that we didn't they didn't have a lot of those in the NFL. Now you see everybody six three six four runs right. a four three four four, but like I said, late nineties there were you know there, there weren't a lot there weren't a lot of those guys. So uh, what was it like playing f with the Vikings? Obviously, you've, uh, like you said, you played with two leg le legendary receivers when hmm. Randy Moss and Chris Carter. Uh, what was that like learning from both of them? And um, obviously, Randy Moss wasn't that the first year, but he came the second year, and then Joe, and then Joe Reed also. Um, so, what was it like learning? Yeah, from Jake, Jake Reed. Yeah, Jake, Jake Reed. Sorry. So, what was it like learning from all those three receivers and uh, and getting advice from them? Um, well, Randall never meant this, but I probably taught him more than I learned from him because, again, just being there that one year prior to. Um, but uh, like I said Chris was uh, he was the Wiley vet. I learned a lot from watching him. I learned I, I took something from all of their game. Like I was I think it's like, you know, Jake just being a big physical receiver. You know, right. sometimes Jake would just be like, club him. Mm -hmm. They get to the line of scrimmage, you know, you you set your feet and you club them and you rip through. You know, Chris was a little bit more crafty, um, how he played the slot, yeah. um, you know, releases and stuff like that. And then Randy just did things like okay, I'd never seen a human do that. Now let me try to do that. <laughs> so I took a little bit from each of their game. Um, but again, I just never got to put it completely together for seasons in a row. Um, but like I said, in my mind, I was, I was there. I was ready um, to take all those things I learned. But it was just good experience, if you will, learning from those guys. Um, more importantly, having friendships. Like I said, right. me, and, me and Randy, we still talk. Uh, constantly and like I said Jake Reed I'll hit up every blue moon or whatever but I think looking back at it now it's the it's the relationships more than again learning a, a technique on the football field from them yeah so uh, was it tough to leave the team that you uh, you got drafted from and obviously NFL is a business and uh, but was it mm -hmm. tough leaving that team and did you consider staying did you did you want to finish your career with one team or I, I wanted to finish my career at one team. At the time, free agency wasn't a huge thing. Um, but then after my fourth year, I, I was ready to spread my wings. So I thought. <laughs> um, and I was I, you know, I, let me move on. I've, I've done everything I could here in Minnesota. And there's just not enough football, right? It's like there's Randy's got to get his touches. Chris got to get his touches. Um, and I just thought that, like, you know, I was ready to go be a, a one or two receiver with the team. And um, I, I was like, I wanted to get out. Hindsight, you know, of course, I think I could have stayed in Minnesota and been a three for a couple more years and then went somewhere. Um, but of course, you know, you don't know those things at the time. I don't regret it, of course, but, you know, it's like you realize uh, if I'm watching ball on Sundays now and they're talking about certain free agents and I'm like 
this kid wouldn't should not leave this team to, to try for agency because he's not going to be a real one. You don't want that pressure of a real one. Yeah. Sometimes you're not ready for uh, the real the real uh, pressure of a number one, and sometimes you're not ready for it too. Um, you know, because a lot of three there's three or four receiver sets like every other play now in the league. So being that third fourth receiver for somebody in their career. I think, you know, helps them during their career. I think uh, an Edelman is a good example. People look at him as a starter. I don't think he could care less if he's uh, considered a starter. He put up the numbers and he was in the game during crunch time. But I mean, those first eight to 10 years for him, he was a third, fourth receiver right. for sure. Third, fourth option, but he was never the guys on the outside. Cause that's an X and a Z. Those are your main receivers and slot guys where we come in and out. Um, but I, you know, I think just people don't realize that's, you know, it's that detail of a game where you don't have to be considered a starter to be a contributor on a team. Hmm. <clears throat> so not only you play for the Vikings, but you play for the Jets, Raiders, you went to CFL too, Central Football League. And, um, you also, uh, uh, NFL Europe actually never oh, made NFL it. Europe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and then you also play for the Jaguars, but, um, yeah, so explain each uh, stop and what did you got? What did you learn from each stop? And uh, speaking of the Raiders, actually next Wednesday I'm having Coach Hugh Jackson on. Hugh, yeah, 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 good guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wasn't there when I was there. We had uh, who was um, Bill Callahan was right there. Oh, wow. wow. And um, Tre Mark Trez. Mark Tresman. Mark Tresman was our offensive coordinator. Mm, yeah, wow. so that was dumb. But yeah, when I went to the Jets, uh, it just wasn't a fit. I, I, again, people like, oh, you just go to a team and you plug in and you go do what you were doing at your last team. It's not even close to that. It's right. just like if you if you bake the cake, again, I'm not a cook, so <laughs> bear with me, but if you bake the cake today and it tasted good, then tomorrow you, you bake the same cake, but instead of using um, all sugar, you used all salt. It's still a cake, yeah, but it's not the same. <laughs> and I just went to the Jets, and it was just – it was not a good fit for me. I was the only receiver that was over six foot. Um, like I said, we had Wayne Corbett, Lavernius Cole, Santana Moss, and the offensive coordinator just looked at me like I'm supposed to move like one of those guys. Like, that's not my game. And looking back at it now, being like I said, being called plays before, being coordinator, it's like – that was just, it wasn't a very smart coordinator, in my opinion, if you think that, you know, a 6'3 receive, receiver is going to be moving like 5'9 receivers. It's a totally different world, and they should be used in total different ways. And, um, again, it just, it, it just didn't go right. Like I said, we weren't, we weren't very good at the beginning of the season. We got hot at the end of the season. It was Herm Edwards' first year. Hmm. But, again, it was great, you know, I said, getting to know the guys and Wayne and Vernius and Santana. Again, I, I just talked to Santana. Had him on the show, actually, uh, a couple oh, of yeah, weeks I ago. Saw, yeah, I saw that one, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, again, as far as football, my football life, it was, it was the worst. It was the worst year. And I just – I didn't know why. Like I said, I, I, the work didn't stop. I was still putting the work. First one out, last one to leave at practice still performing at a high level. Um, I just didn't get the opportunities because the coordinator wanted, you know, to do it a certain way, um, you know, and have a certain system that really didn't fit my skill set. Like I was, you know, a downfield, you know, a jump ball, big, big play receiver. Um, I wasn't, you know, a, a shallow cross in and out, you know, dodge guy. And that's what he wanted. So, you know, it is what it is. I learned from it and I just moved on. And, uh, you know, luckily I got a shot with the Raiders the following year. Um, but, of course, I hurt my shoulder and got hurt. So I sat out that whole year. And um, that, was, that was that for the Jets and, and Raiders, you know, uh, seasons, of course. Yeah, so um, obviously I want to ask you this. Uh, what was it like playing underneath Coach Herm Edwards? And um, obviously Herm, Herm Edwards is a coach for Arizona State now, and um, he's doing a great job there rebuilding that program. And what was it just – uh, what was it just learning from him? And obviously his press conference was legendary too. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, Herm, he was a defensive guy. So anytime you have deep, a defensive guy, defensive coach in an in a NFL locker room, everything is skewed for the defense. And then when you have an offensive guy, like I had in Minnesota, Denny Green was an offensive guy. So it was skewed to the offense. So we really didn't see Denny a lot. Again, he was down there with the, with the defense, making sure they were doing what they were supposed to do. Um, 
but as a as a coach, I mean, I guess you know more of a motivator. I think he I probably fits the college game even better than the pro game because of like I said, you know, eighteen to twenty two year olds more about said keeping motivated, staying motivated. Um, the pro game, it's about respect and honesty, um, you know, from the from the guys in the locker room. And I just think that at that time, you know, for a, a younger coach in New York, the energy and all that, I think, again, that was great for the Jets and great for, you know, New York at the time. I just think over time, I guess they didn't buy it. And I think that's when, you know, he ended up leaving. But again, they were pretty good for a couple of years. Um, but he said Arizona State's doing great now. And again, I definitely think he's, uh, he fits the, the, the Sun Devils, uh, you know, staff and, and their personality up there in college. Yeah, so I want to switch gears. Obviously, you want to get to your podcast now with Tara Owens. And um, how did this come about? When did you guys start doing this podcast? And um, get your popcorn ready. I, that's, I like the name of it. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. So, so when did you guys start this? And um, obviously, you had some really good guests on. And um, are you guys currently working on something big for the show coming up? Um, so, yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm mad because I didn't come up with the name. Actually, we worked <laughs> on names for, like, almost two months. And this is one of the first ones he brought up. And I was just like, no, that's not it. And I tried and text people and email people. What about this name and this name? And, you know, it's, and I just, we, it didn't ring, nothing rang. And then I was like, yeah, let me be honest. Yeah, T, let's call it Get Your Popcorn. Yeah. That was from his, uh, you know, his, yeah. his uh, sideline antics, you know, 20 years ago or something. But um, so yeah, I, 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 I did like it. It stuck. And of course that was the name we stuck with. And it's going good. Like I said, yeah. We uh, got a year in, um, you know, said so the guests are, it's, it's, we want to, we don't want to be in just the football box. It's a sports and entertainment yeah. podcast. Again, we're going to, we're two ex football players. So we're going to talk football. Um, but we don't want to get into, okay, the Buffalo Bills versus the Kansas City Chiefs. And on third and four, they were in cover two, and they bill should. We, we just don't want to, you know, get into into depth of football. We want to just talk, uh, you know, the outside of the game, outside the lines of football, and more importantly, give some of the guys platforms who might be doing other things. Like I said, we found out a bunch of stuff about some of our guests that we didn't know. Um, again, like Charles Woodson, like his wine company is is doing great right now. Like I said, uh, Keenan Allen, you know, <laughs> wanting to be a singer when he gets done playing. Uh, Larry Fitzgerald being part owner wow. yeah. of the Phoenix Suns. You know, all those things are very important for other athletes to, to listen to because they have to understand, yeah, this is what you do, but you're not doing this forever. You have to set up, you know, your, after your career and, and take advantage while you do have that NFL name tag behind you. And you're not, you're not going to have forever. Um, some guys have two to four years. Some guys going to have 10. But regardless – you know, you have to start getting your mindset. You don't have to focus on it, but get your mindset to say, you know, okay, when I'm done, this is where I want to be. Or like, say, even when I'm playing, okay, this is when I'm playing, I want to save up this much money so I can do A, B, or C when I get right. done. So I think those things are important, and we try to get that message across. Um, I love the Larry Fitzgerald one just sticks out with me because he just, it's about me and T would like to be more mentorship um, conversations via zoom if you will that's what it's about when you're talking to these current players because everybody's going to be the same right everybody's going to be an ex-player sooner or later no matter if you're on top of the world right now or like i say you're going you're you're a role player it doesn't matter um and i think the the entertainer side gives us a different perspective right so talking to ice cube and cedric the entertainer you know yeah. the Don ramirez stories like they're all connected through that struggle and triumph of obstacles and opportunities as they, to get to the points where they are in their life. Hmm. And those things are important for people to hear. Cause a lot of people don't understand like, well, I'm going through, well, it doesn't matter. Right? Everybody's going to go through something. It's all about how you react to it. Not what you, how, not what you go through. So I think those things are important. And it's funny because the more of those stories I hear, the more they're tied to, you know, the, the four year NFL veteran, it's right. the same type of story, just a different lane. And so that's, I'm enjoying it though. We're having fun and trying to educate and entertain at the same time. So um, obviously you, are you currently working, uh, working on some things for the, the next episodes coming up for you guys? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So we got some, uh, we got some, some big names coming up. I don't want to give away too much, but we got, yeah. again, got some entertainment trying to, we'll try to get some, some holiday themed <laughs> stuff in. Uh, of course it's been harder 
right. the last six months regarding the COVID situation because we were in studio. Um, now we're via Zoom. So we're trying to still be creative. And uh, again, anybody who has some, you know, some creative ideas and content ideas, send them to us. Like send them to the, you know, to the, to the, um, to the DMs and the uh, IGs and Twitter and all that stuff because we're always looking to just create content. Of course, as you know, right now the whole world is looking for new digital content. Yeah. We're just trying to be one of those platforms for everybody to reach. Yeah, I would like I like to be I would like to be on your podcast. That'd be awesome, man. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, well, well, yeah. We might have to get you on, man. Come up there, talk about some ball, man. Like I said, yeah, I, you're yeah. on your five. We're way, we're only on forty or fifty. I'm at, like five hundred and seventy six. So you live on this thing, man. Yeah, Congratulations five, to you, man. Yeah, five hundred. No, you're you're my five hundred seventy eighth, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I know. So, I get a, I get a reward for that. I get some balloons or something. Yeah, you get um, you're gonna get uh. Yeah, probably balloons or something. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I get it. I'll take no, no, it. I'll no, but it. my goal, my goal is to get Tara Owens on the show pretty soon. He said he said he 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 told me that he's gonna let me know soon. Probably he's he's busy right now. But yeah, yeah, he's all he's always busy. He'll yeah he'll do it. I'm sure. He, like I say, he'll he'll do it. he'll get on here and like to catch up and and talk about talk about himself. He doesn't he doesn't shy away from talking about himself. Yeah. So. I'm sure he'll get on and have a good time. <laughs> is he willing to do interviews on Instagram Live, or does he do on only on? Um, I don't know. You just have to ask. He's done all of them. Yeah, just ask him. Like I say, you know, as long as you're, you just keep communicating with him, keep the ball in the air. Um, again, it's it's funny because we you come up against the same obstacles. Yeah. As you do for because it's somebody in the football space. We put right. a hold of anybody, and we've we brushed paths with anybody over the last you know five to ten years, of course. Right. Um, and then the entertainment business is the same type of thing. You're like, you're, you're with one degrees of separation. Like, oh yeah, I saw such and such or ran into such and such. And, um, and the sports and entertainment lane, it's, it's connected. I know 20 years ago, nobody thought it was. And again, some of those people got ridiculed for those types of things. Uh, I remember in Minnesota, I, I got a, I got a sweep for, uh, Lil Wayne and baby to come to a game. Oh, wow. Yeah. And everybody's like, oh, he's not focused on the game. You yeah. know, Little Wayne and, and, and a Baby, they have a concert in Minnesota, and they're coming right. to the suite, and they know Hatch and Culpepper. They even, I'm like, it's just part of it. And, of course, fast forwarding 20 years, everybody knows. That's just part of it. It has, it right. has nothing to do with taking away focus from you going to play, but the preparation and all that things people get people get excited about and think it's um think it's going to be a distraction it's not a distraction you're going to do your job and later on the entertainers go do their job and you go to their concerts and you go to their shows and it's the same thing they're they're there doing their thing and you're there watching as a spectator and again i, I love the sports and entertainment you know business in a whole yeah so like for me um i do another podcast with my other friends also um but that's on hold for now so we're, we're just building our own brands so with this, my platform, I'm, I, I, I had actress, singers on, um, I had even entrepreneurs on my show and um, I like to mix it up just like you guys and not only football or basketball, but like, uh, for example, I had on like Nate Burleson, um, uh, yeah. Nate Woody, Willie Cologne. I had uh, David Tyree on and I, nice. had, I had Antonio Cromartie on. Uh, Pro, yeah, yeah. And, and I actually, I had his cousin on too, Demo Dominic Rogers Camardi. I had him on. Yeah, yeah, DRC. Yeah. So, um, it's it just a, for me, it's just an honor to able to talk to you guys, not only about your career journeys, but life goals and um, mm -hmm. and, and, and inspiration stories. That, that's what I'm all about with, with the podcast, in, inspiring stories and how you guys work hard to get to where you are right now. That's that's what I that's what my main focus is for this podcast, just to get to know everybody's personalities and um. And uh, like once in a while, I uh, we I do group interviews with my with my friends and um and then we bring on guests on their shows too. So we're we're all mi mixed up as a podcast family. Well, again, I, I, you know, talking about being an inspiration, you are just that. I mean, because there's tons of people out there saying, you know, what do I do? How do I just go? Just get started. <laughs> just you know, again, you, it's it's you're gonna you've reached out to a lot of people. You don't always get a yes. Right, you don't always get a yes on the first try. You could get 20 no's, but it doesn't matter. Just keep trying, keep putting your, your content out, keep uh, putting yourself out there to, to be recognized. And, and the business, the I guess, you know, fate or the world will tell you, like I said, do we like it or not over a certain period of time? 
but don't be shy on getting started. You know, for people out there, because everybody just wakes up and saying, maybe I should do this. And what about this today? Just go, just do it, man. Because again, if you don't, somebody else will. Yeah. Just again, congratulations to you. Keep doing your thing, man. That's cool. That's good, good. stuff. Thank you. Yeah. So um, my next question to you, I want to get to this current season. Obviously, I, be, I, I bet you, you guys have been talking about this season, obviously, but what are your overall thoughts on this season? And some stadiums do have fans, fans coming in and, um, mm -hmm. But it's a different world we're living in, obviously, and it's weird not seeing the full fans of football. And uh, but what is what is your overall thoughts? Um, so far, the brand on the field has looked great for the the fan. Like I said, you because only thing that the stadium is missing is crowd noise. Right. But as you're watching TV, you get the crowd noise, so it looks exactly the same. The angles are the same. The noise is the same. The commentator is the same. Like I said, people out there, some catches are being made, some catches are being dropped. It, sometimes there's a sack, sometimes there's a touch. It's all the same. So I think from that standpoint, I think the NFL is doing great. Um, and people keep saying, well, I don't think the NFL is going to, you know, finish the season. Go, oh, it's going to finish. Like I said, it's going to start and it's going to finish because what the NFL has done, they have branded the shield. They have branded – the Kansas City Chiefs uniform, the colors. So if Patrick Mahomes doesn't play for two weeks because of COVID, you're still watching the Kansas City Chiefs. Right. So people are still going to tune in and, and watch the Kansas City Chiefs on Fox at 1 o'clock and blah, blah, blah. And I said they're going to watch the Bills. They're going to watch Monday night. They're going to watch Thursday night. It doesn't matter. So the NFL, I think, understands that. They're like, yeah, we're going to miss out on maybe, you know, two, three billion dollars on the um, – stadiums being closed or we're not selling merch and selling jerseys and you know food parking all that stuff that stadiums get but they're still going to make their probably 12 to you know 10 to 12 billion dollars just with the tv contracts alone because those games are being showed and people are still watching hmm. so um I, i'm a big dallas cowboy fan here i'm so sorry yeah um, so sorry. As for, this is where i'm going to ask you a couple questions obviously being a re receiver and what the heck is going on with the Cowboys right now? And uh, obviously, we, we, uh, players lost the locker room at Mike McCarthy, in my opinion. That's what I'm guessing. Um, and people continue to deny that. And I, I, I don't know what's going on. But Mike Nolan, first of all, the defense is horrible. Uh, I don't know why Mike Nolan is here. But I just want to give you overall thoughts. We have the best receiving crew, in my opinion, in the, in the league. Do you agree? You, you don't. No, you don't have the best <laughs> receiving core. <laughs> I mean, you have, a, you have a solid receiving core. But, um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think you guys have the best. I mean, that was, well, Tampa Bay is now uh, – Tampa Bay is loaded now with Antonio Brown. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, you, I don't even put Antonio Brown in the receiving core, and they still have a good receiving core. But, um, like I said, the Cowboys himself <clears> – this is the, the – <clears throat> excuse me, this is the situation or the, uh, the reality of all season, right? Because every year, and in, in even this year, including this year, you have, I'd say probably 20% of their sports commentators saying Dallas is going to win the division or Dallas is going to go to the Super Bowl, right? And if you've been saying that for five years, you eventually have to – become a professional and get a little bit and dig a little bit deeper into are you being a fan or are you being smart with the conversation? Right. Because, for example, the Cowboys and the Saints, they've been trending up for five years. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're supposed to make it this year. They're supposed – and they, they haven't make it. You don't continue to trend up. It's like when you're trending up, that means everything is going right. Number one, injuries is going right. That's a big piece. Uh, all right, number two, you're getting all the bounces, loose balls, and all that stuff is going right. Number three, again, you're going to go ahead and, and win some games you shouldn't have won. And that doesn't happen for no 10 years. So the Cowboys and Saints both, I'm just like, I think they both had their time. And they're going to go, they're going to trend down for a couple of years, and then they'll trend back up. But they're not going to just keep trending up just because everybody wants them to trend up. And I think when people are in the locker room, they have to understand we're, you know, we're here on borrowed time more than, yeah, we hit this at the right time and we should be going to the bowl this year. I don't care what the roster says. Yeah. Like if you haven't went going to the Super Bowl, you're not champions. Right. You know, and that's just the reality of it. So like, you know, I, I get the the outside eyeballs on the Cowboys, but yeah, it's just not again for everybody to play 
at their best every single year. That's when you're trending up, but they're not doing that now. And they really weren't doing that last year. And I, I feel the same thing about the Saints. Again, Drew Brees, the, those last three years in the playoffs, Drew Brees has not played well. And again, he'll put up numbers in regular season, but again, they're not the same team that they were three years ago. And he's not the same quarterback. No, he's one of the great quarterbacks, but at the same time, they're trending down right now uh, compared to being ready to go to the Super Bowl. And I, again, I said the same thing in June and July and August, but the records weren't out yet. So, oh no, you're wrong. Like, okay, you'll see. So, and, it, and now, and you got your, you got teams that, that take their place. Like I said, the Cardinals are trending up because you have a young quarterback and you have young players around them um, and, and a good, and a young coaching staff. So they're trending up, you know, so that, again, the Buffalo Bills are trending up. I don't think they're there yet in the AFC, but they're trending up and they're not going to trend up for the next 10 years, but if you get that two or three year run, then that's the difference. Yeah. So, um, Obviously, <laughs> I'm hoping Andy Dalton is okay for Sunday's game against the Eagles, but I don't, I, I don't, under, I don't think we should play him at this point. But Ben, De, ben DiNucci is a uh, third string, but I don't believe in him yet. So I, we need to get a quarterback somehow. I kept, I keep saying Ryan Fitzmagic, man. Uh, uh, the Cowboys should go after him. And, Wait, Fitz? Yeah. Well, this, is the, this is the reason they're not going to, because they're saying the money is not going to be worth it if we're not going to win the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. like, people have the, uh, people, they don't understand that <clears throat> every player in the room in the NFL locker room wants to win on Sunday, but it's not equivalent to every owner wanting to win every day of the year. Right. And again, if, could you have February, 21st you have March 13th you have May 2nd you have all these dates where the general managers owners and pro personnel they have to make those moves then at those moments they have to win that day and if they don't then it doesn't matter about the 53 guys in the locker room you're not going to be able to win it at all they're not the Bengals are not ready to win right now right so next offseason they're going to have a couple days where they should get a certain free agent in or they should get or maybe release a certain player, whatever those moves are, you're going to have to make those moves in the offseason in order to trend up while you have a young quarterback who you think that might want to go to the Super Bowl. You can't just say, I want to go to the Super Bowl. It doesn't happen like that. you got to put – like everybody's got to be on the same page. Everybody's going to be trying to want to win that year, like everybody in the organization, else it's just not going to happen. Yeah, so for you being a former wide receiver, I want to ask you this. What's it like seeing Des Bryant back in the league and also Antonio Brown getting another chance? Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully he can uh, stick to his uh, routine and not even not focus on the negative things. But yeah. for, what advice? I oh, sorry. I think that the, the practice squad, um, the implementation of the practice squad that you can have veterans on it are the reasons that Dez and AB are on teams. I'm, I'm happy for them, but if it wasn't the COVID situation, I don't think they would have got brought in, right? So take advantage of the situation, though, right? So great. Now that they're on the team, so what the team's going to say, okay, have them run our system for a couple weeks, see if he is who we think he could be from two or three years ago. If he is, then we'll put him in a game and give him his 10, 15 plays. But whole week one, getting nine catches for 150 in either one of those systems is not going to happen. So, you know, it's like everybody just pumped their brakes. Like these kids, they got to get back in shape. They got to get in professional shape. They got to get in professional football game shape. And then they have to have some success. So, I mean, if you again, would you put your money on both are going to, you know, have a successful eight games this year? No, like one might. And one might, you know, but it's going to be hard for both of them guys just to come in. They care less what you did in the past. It's just, it's too, if it was uh, two months ago and they had a great preseason or something, you know, that's something different. But this is years. This is two years ago. Like these dudes in the NFL have been, you know, going for, what, we're on week eight? Yeah. In season form. They played last year. AB and Dez both didn't play last year. It's like, I think Dez is, uh, I guess humility might be the best thing for him and he might understand it's going to take a process to get myself back going and be ready for weeks 12 through 16 to make a playoff push um, and get ready for the playoffs. 
But again, to come in and say, I want the ball, uh, you know, week eight, I need, you know, 10 targets. I mean, that's just, I don't think, I hope neither one are thinking like that. I definitely don't think Dez is. And I, I hope AB is not thinking like that. Yeah, so I'm going to send, so uh, like I said before, I do a podcast with my other friends, but I'm going to send you a couple of my other friends' podcasts and then so you can check them out. And Cool, uh, yeah, most yeah. definitely. And also, uh, there's this one you should, do, you should definitely check out. He's 14 years old, Global Kid Media. Um, he's interviewed over a thousand people, and uh, he's trying to be the first sideline kid reporter. So, what do you think of the idea of having kids as sideline reporters now? Uh, I love it. I love it. Anything that you know, really, I say kids. Really, I mean twenty-one and under. <laughs> um, and when they're trying to do stuff like that, I, I absolutely love it. Anything I could do to help, definitely let me know. Um, but yeah, that's that's awesome. You know, it's like that's uh, it brings something to the game. It brings something to the you know a little bit more excitement. Uh, again, we've been this this NFL has been around for around for a long time. It's like any time you can change it up, and it's not affecting the game at all. You know, I don't care if you let the kid go out all the first play of the game. Like that would be cool. You know what I'm saying? Let let the 12 year old drop a play yeah. for for week for for a first play in the Super Bowl. Like that's awesome. I, you know, I wish I had that power to do that. But uh, anything like that for like for the game of football, I absolutely love. Yeah, so now I do this fun little segment with all my guests that come on the show. It's called the rapid fire segment. You ready for this? I'm ready, brother. I'm ready. <laughs> so I got to ask you this. I don't know if someone told you that you look like LeBron a little bit. <laughs> no, I've never heard that. I've heard Will Smith a lot. Oh, Will Smith too. Yeah, Will Smith. <laughs> I've never heard LeBron. No, not at all. That's funny. <laughs> we yeah. are from Cleveland. That's about all we have going for ourselves. <laughs> uh, favorite food? <clears throat> Seafood. Hmm. Actually, speaking of LeBron, um, have you con- have you connected with LeBron before in person or? Uh, yeah, uh, well, I think like once out here, like w- way a ways back, um, and I've been over to his co- his company uninterrupted a couple times here in in LA. Oh, wow. um, but yeah, I haven't ran into him since he's been a Laker though, actually. Yeah, so um, ha- have you guys? Obviously, he's busy right now with the, his fourth ring championship. But are you gonna guys, are you guys gonna reach out to him potentially to come on your podcast? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, he's after, after you win championships, you're kind of, you're on a, you're on a magic carpet ride for a couple months. So you go ahead and let that die down and then try to get him on the show. We'd love to have LeBron on the show. And we actually want to get Mav Card on the show as well. So. Oh, wow. Mav Card. Yeah, let's get the whole crew on the show. Who knows? Yeah. You never know. Yeah. So uh, my next one here, does Tara Owens have, does, do you guys eat your popcorn while on the podcast? T.O. or eat popcorn? Um, I nibbled on it a couple times. It actually, when we're in studio, it is fresh. And like I said, we put it on right, be- right before the uh, guest comes on. So it is good. Um, I'm just not a big popcorn eater because I have retainers in my mouth. And the <laughs> seeds and all that always get stuck in, the, um, in, my, in my retainers. So. Um, but, yes, he definitely eats popcorn all the time. <laughs> He's a popcorn junkie. Yeah, so um, obviously, Tara Owens, you, I, I bet you saw that video with him racing with Tyreek Hill. Yeah. Um, is he trying to make a – do you think he can still play in the league now, Tara Owens? He can play one play. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we, we argue about it all the time. You know, we banter. That's what we do. We banter. We're banterers. Um, but, yeah, he can play one play. It would, the, the challenge is not the actual play. It's the recovery. Right. So, again, anybody – you can take any Wiley vet, Hall of Famer, whatever. I can go out there and play one quarter. Yeah. and play five plays in the quarter. But that following week of recovery is the kicker, you know, because, I mean, shoot, if I, <laughs> even like five years ago when I try to go, you know, play some basketball or something, it takes me a week to recover. Like, yeah, I don't start feeling good, so I wouldn't feel good until game day, you know. So that's the – it's about the recovery. It's not about the actual act. Um, what's your, what, what was your most memorable game that you played in college and the NFL and uh, Europe? Oh, and um, NFL Europe. Um, <laughs> I guess going against my buddy Isaac Keys. Um, I think it was um, the Seth Claymores. Ah, oh, forget the blue, gray, and yeah, blue, gray team. I think it's some, something Scottish, Scotland, Scotland Claymores. And I remember because he just told me this story like five years ago. He's like um, him and his boys. They put a bounty out on me that game. Oh. Yeah, like I said, got to get you know. I was tearing up NFL Europe, but right. um, but we put they put a bounty out on me to get me you know to you know hurt me or whatever, get me out the game. This is all part of you know 
playing ball 20 years ago, everybody. So don't get me too excited. Um, and um, and I, I just, I killed him. I probably, you know, had like eight, nine catches for 120 and a touchdown or something like that. So, um, but that was just, I just remember the feeling I had before that game. Like these guys is out here trying to kill me, <laughs> but uh, I got the best of them. And again, I, I, had, I had some success in that game. Um, and then when I was at Langston, um, probably one of our homecoming games, you know, I just was, uh, it was always about, I was trying to get to the league, you know, so I was like, I just got to, no game was bigger than the other. It's like, I just got to make a play, you know, I, I had to make, I, my, my, my coach would always say, make them go wow. I had to have a wow play, like one a game. And um, so I think I consistently did that, you know, and then in the league, probably, Probably the eight, my eight when I had went for eighty against the 49ers. because again it was that pre- preparation for that week. Right. Like Chris would always say, okay, the Niners are coming in. Jerry's here, you know. <laughs> Jerry, Chris Carter were yeah. one, you know, one A and two A, or one A and one B at the time. And like I said, we had our receiving core. They had their receiving core, and so it was like we had to perform as a core, not just me. But I, you know, I got to contribute contribute a lot that day. And I remember I went for eighty. I was just thinking about that. Like, yeah, we definitely had the better receiving yeah. core. We argue about it now. Like, we had the whole receiving core on the show. Get your popcorn ready. We had Jerry Rice come oh, on nice. with J. Dopes, and then T.O. was on it, of course. And uh, so we got to talk about that. So, um, but yeah, that that's memorable now as well. Were you guys trash, talk, trash talking the whole time, pretty much? Of course. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what makes it fun. I mean, <laughs> When I was playing, I like during the game, I didn't have the confidence enough to trash talk like right. between plays. Now I could go on the sideline and scream across 50 yards, you know, something like that. But I was just so in my head of what I had to do next play and did I get this one right? And, you know, everything was just moving so fast. Um, I, I never got to that point where I relaxed in the league, you know, and I think that's even like my my what seventh year I was just like it was still it wasn't moving fast the game wasn't moving fast I just didn't want to take a split second off mentally just in case if that second you know was a game changer so um so my next one here what are your thoughts on C.E. Lamb so far as a player with the Dallas Cowboys He's got some potential. Uh, again, I, I, I don't even put people in other people's categories until they've played four years. I, I just can't stand the everybody has one good quarter or a good half. This is the next Calvin Johnson. This is the next Randy Moss. This is the next T.O. Like, are you serious right now? He's not even through his whole season. Um, but of course media does that, you know, I don't even look at Twitter on Sundays cause it's just absolutely ridiculous. Dude makes one catch. Oh, he's the next. I'm like, these dudes played 10 years and 12 years. This guy's on his second year and you guys are putting him in a Barry Sanders and Walter Payton categories. I'm like, don't, don't do that to this guy. <laughs> um, so again, I think he'll be, I think he has a potential to be a, a pro bowler, um, which again, get to the pro bowls first and right then you get multiple pro bowlers then or m- multiple pro bowls and then you get to the point okay you're getting doubled and triple teamed by a defensive coordinator and then we'll start talking about is he great you know what i'm saying but until then like i just yeah i'm rooting for him rooting for all of them um but until then like i say he, he has a lot of work to do um do you guys have your super bowl picks ready or so early to tell um, I mean, right now, the best, the best teams in the NFC are the Seahawks, Buccaneers, and the Packers, right? Those three by far. Um, and then in the AFC, the Ravens, the Steelers. Uh, um, and the, Chiefs. The, the Chiefs are in there, but I, I, just, I, I, I don't think they're going to repeat. I'll put it that way. So, I, again, those are the three best in the AFC, but I don't think they're going to repeat. Um, are you surprised the way the Steelers are playing right now on a high level? No, no, not at all. With that defense, like that number 48, that linebacker, he just brings a different energy. And they all – and, again, he brings the energy and they all pick up on the energy. Right. And you have a veteran quarterback. Like I said, you you have enough playmakers. All those receivers, none of those, including Juju, right? Love Juju. That's, like I said, coached him in high school, one of my kids, right? They're not all – want like a, a, a hot pro bowl and superstars but they're good as a core like they have three 
four, good as a core and a good enough running game as well. But they have Big Ben, which is a big difference. If he can stay healthy and you have that defense, they'll be there in the end. So I'm, ne I'm never surprised with a Mike Tomlin team if they're healthy. Never. So um, do you think uh, – my next one here is um, do you see any more big trades happening before no the November 3rd trade deadline? Oh, shoot. I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, every, the, thing, the thing about trades is every NFL team is trying to trade all of their players. <laughs> it's a conversation. That's, they're not wanting to, but, I mean, the Cowboys, they took a phone call regarding Dak Prescott being traded, I'm sure. I don't know, you know, I don't know who the team was. I don't know if it was a good off, whatever, but they, every, they, every team's looking at every roster, you know, so that always happens, you know, so it just depends on who's where. And right now, halfway through the season, who's trying to get to that championship level um, this year? It's because some people think if we get here this year, we're going to go back to back and win a couple, um, you know, two or three. And then some people think like the Buccaneers, like, hey, we just have to get there this year. I don't know if Tom's coming back next year. Hmm. Right, but we're going to worry about this year. So, but everybody's every team's trying to trade at least 10 players on their team right now. So, what's it like seeing, um, a, like a city of like in LA? What's going they're going through a lot in LA right now with the wildfires and obviously the loss of Kobe. And what's it like seeing being them being uh for them being a title town this year with the Lakers and the Dodgers? Um, uh, it's cool. I, I guess they can't uh, enjoy it like they would have if, again, if they were doing the parades and all that. So I'm hopeful. I'm hoping that they're not all out partying together regarding COVID and staying away from each other. I'm not from LA, so it doesn't affect me. I'm not a Dodger fan or a Laker fan. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's good for the city. Like you know, I said, uh, brings up morale, which is great. You know, and everybody having a, a good moment for the time. So that's that's great. That's great for them. And so maybe the Rams will get back and you know, make, maybe make a trifecta. Who knows, you know? All right. So I got to ask you this. This is a million-dollar question here. Since you're being from Ohio, Cleveland, what do you think of the Browns? Are they for real this year? And uh, do you see them trading Odell Beckham before the November 3rd trade deadline? Or because, They're definitely uh, not going to Actually, he's not for the season, but he's not going to get traded. But do you, yeah. do you see I, He's definitely not going to get traded. Unfortunately, he, again, the injury is one yeah. thing. Um, I feel bad for him. Yeah. Um, but again, are they tr are they trending up for NFL? No. Are they trending up for the Cleveland Browns? Yes. Yeah. Big difference. It, it's like if a team goes 0 and 16 one year, and the next year they go 4 and 12. Oh, we're having a great year. Yeah, for you guys. But the team's going 12 and 4 over here. Like we're not even respecting you. So again, gr great for them. Great for the organization. Great for the city to have them winning some games. Now, do I put them in the top? five no do uh, do they make the seventh uh playoff spot because we have seven this year possibly i still don't think they're going to the super bowl i honestly don't even think they'll probably have a you know a winning record i still think they'll probably be eight and eight you know at the end of the day if they get to nine and seven great that's great for the browns but again until you hit that 12 and 4 13 and 3 mark in the division and you start beating baltimore at least splitting with baltimore and pittsburgh um, then you know you're not you're not part of the conversation. But it's good that they have gotten better. And again, they're they're are they going to trend up next year? Is the question. Like so this year they'll be doing this. Now next year are they going to plateau or are they going to keep trending up? Because now now if they go from eight and eight and they go to ten and six, now we're starting to talk. Yeah. So like I said, I told you uh, next Wednesday I'm having Hugh Jackson on. So um, I'm going to ask him this. I'm going to ask you this question, but I'm going to ask him in a different perspective. But do you, do you see him getting another chance as a head coach in the league? Hugh? Yeah. Oh, I think if he wants, if he wants to, um, again, like some of some coaches when they you know get out, they're just like, I'm, I'm cool with being a position coach. And some people like, yeah, when I was a head coach, I didn't love it. You know, it's not what I thought it was going to be. If that's possible. So um, if he wants to, I'm sure he could probably put his put his ring in, put his name in the uh, in the hat and uh, get a coaching job. Because again, he had some success and he he knows the game. And it, there's not there's not a lot of um, you know ex African American head coaches that are even available. And he's yeah. one he's like you know one of five. So I'm sure if he wants to, he'll, he can probably get a job. Yeah. So would you consider being a coach in the NFL, like a receivers coach or? You know what? I tried. I tried. I really wanted to be on the general manager side, but again, I've been doing the whole yeah. going to the combine and, and 
all-star games and senior bowl for years upon years. I guess I just never really got my shot. You know, I, again, I know the game. Uh, I know, I know football. Um, again, I played with the receivers I played with. Again, I think I, I probably have a long list of pro bowl hall of fame guys that no one else has played with. So I played with Randy and Chris. I played with Jerry Rice and Tim Brown, both in Oakland. Um, and I played with Jimmy Smith in Jacksonville, hmm. right? Then, you know, I had, so I had Santana, Lavernius, and Corbett in New York. Um, so again, I, I know what it looks like, and I know how to articulate it. And for the, for the most part, coaches in the NFL, it's not all about what you know. It's about how you can articulate what the boss, what the coordinator wants to his people. And if you, you know, so I, and if they don't trust you to do that, they don't bring you in. And again, my coaching tree from the Denny Green, Brian Billick era is not in the league. So, you know, nobody was really trying to, you know, they just like, okay, thanks, but no thanks type of deal. So, you know, it is what it is. So uh, who's more competitive and fiery on the podcast, you or T.O.? Oh, he's more competitive because he don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> I, don't, I, I just tell the truth and let it, and let uh, it be. He, he wants to lie about it and argue. That's the difference. Of course, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, hey, go ahead. <laughs> Just because you huffing and puffing don't mean you blowing the house down. You right. know what I'm saying? So, no, but we have fun. No, that's yeah. the bottom line. We have fun. It's a, it's a, it's an escape for me. And so we just enjoy, really enjoy learning about our guests. And again, putting the information out there so the whole world can, can understand. Like in this journey, we're, we're, in, we're all in this together. And we're everybody just trying to get to the top of the mountain. And the more people you have with you in your corner, the easier it'll be. So the last two things here before I let you go, this is a question I've been bringing up to all my guests and th about the late Kobe Bryant, his daughter, Gianna, and then the mm -hmm. rest of the people that were involved in the horrible crash. And do you remember mm -hmm. where you were at that day and what did they mean to you? Yeah, I was, uh, I was here. I was here at home. And I remember I called T. I called T and I was like, did you hear? Or I know I text him. I was like, did you hear about Kobe? He's like, yeah, he's like, I'm trying to get him on the show. And I'm like, no, he just passed. And he, then he called me and we talked about it for a little bit. And it bothered me. Again, I don't, I don't know Kobe like that, but it just bothered me because, you know, when you see somebody that you think is doing it the right way or trying their hardest, you just like, you're root for them. And then for it to be taken away, you're just like, why? And you start questioning, you know, you do the question thing and, you know, you just have to learn from it. And I think that's the, at that point, I was like, let me just learn something from this you know I'll be there for anybody who needs me but at the same time learn something from this and the last thing here would you like to say anything to all the nurses doctors and essential workers yes thank you uh we appreciate <laughs> you and and keep doing your thing again as we can all get through this together uh we appreciate the long hours and the unselfish hours that you put in and we we beg and plead for you to just keep up the good work and keep being leaders in our community get your popcorn ready yeah there you go there it is uh episode 578 uh matthew hatchett uh former nfl receiver and now does a podcast with with the great tara owens another former nfl receiver um you guys do a fantastic job keep up the great work you guys are keeping people entertained and uh, i'm looking forward to seeing you guys doing more episodes i'm i'm I obviously you can't announce it yet but i'm looking forward to your next guest and uh, next Thank episode and keep up the awesome work and I would like to be on your podcast one day, and um, Absolutely. yeah, if you don't mind, uh, can you can you uh, mention this to uh, Santonio uh, Holmes, if you don't mind? I would like to get him on the thing too. Santonio, San yeah, Holmes, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah that'd be awesome. And uh, hopefully, at some point, Tio comes on here after he sees. Yeah, it. you'll get you'll get him on. You'll get yeah. Tio on. Yeah, but you and your family stay safe. Thank you. You as well, brother. Thanks for having me. Yep. All right, peace.